We're approaching it from this very technical, how can I diagnose and identify, right, where I lost the pitch, right, where I said the wrong thing. We're going to need to listen more closely to every single thing, every single data point that those buyers are giving us in those conversations as to what that persona responds to in a buying process. This isn't your average revenue podcast. It's Ashley and Katrina's Infinite Revenue Playlist, powered by Comsor. And it's your new work bestie. Through conversations with other women in the revenue space, Ashley and Katrina get candid about their unique experiences, help women tackle challenges in the workplace, and uncover ways to grow as revenue pros. Maybe you'll learn a little, cry a little, laugh a little, have an epiphany, or at the very least, get a killer playlist to listen to while you work. Being a woman in this industry is wild. Let's talk about it. Welcome to another episode of Ashley and Katrina's Infinite Revenue Playlist. Today, our guest is Nikki Ivy. Nikki, thanks for joining us today. Nikki has a ton of experience in sales. She's been everything from an SDR all the way up to a CRO. She has over a decade of sales experience with focus on building community. She loves to talk about culture, career progression. And at the end of the day, Nikki is passionate about helping salespeople get Yay, better at their us. jobs. <laughs> It's true. Everything you said is true. I'm, is this the part where I say my walk-up song? I'm not sure. Yes, I'm please. Nikki Ivy, and my walk-up yes. song is Circus by Britney Spears. First of all, that song is a banger, but <laughs> why is that your walk-up song? So the thing about Britney Spears is a lot of her songs, the very first line, the very first line, like she's telling you something that is just so confident, right? And so like unambiguously, I got this. And the first lines of that song go there's only two types of people in the world the ones that entertain and the ones that observe well baby i'm gonna put on a show kind of girl don't like the back seat gotta be first and i'm like yeah so <laughs> this is why you're in sales <laughs> <laughs> yeah yep well, we guess- people sleep on brady yeah, it's pop music but bars <laughs> She's iconic. And I will Brady's say, awesome. I guess salespeople are all kind of show performers to an extent. So it makes it's sense. It's true. Like all eyes are on me in the center of the ring. Like it, that's what the sales floor or an individual sales call can feel like, right? There's a spotlight, there's a microphone. And your choice is to own the room and make people feel the way they like to feel or let dead air <laughs> ruin the whole thing. I'll be scared. Yeah. I love that. That's a great choice. Nikki, you have had a very exciting and fun career. And I feel like we could make some more comparisons between this song and what you've done in your career. So if you don't mind telling us a little bit about how you've done pretty much every role in the revenue space as a woman, that would be pretty awesome. Yeah, I mean, I wish that I could say I was special, but I think, you know, that's only part of the story. I think I think I'm more lucky than anything else. Right. And for me, being able to have access to that, those lucky opportunities and lucky encounters required me to be more open to the idea that good things can happen to me than I was able to do for a while. You know, but that was sort of the turnaround for me was like, wait a minute, I deserve good things. So I guess what I'm saying is step one was a mindset shift. I have these three themes, right? It is mindset, moxie, and magic. The mindset piece is what I just talked about, right? Stop telling yourself that, you know, you don't deserve the opportunities that you want or you've made too many mistakes for that to still be an option for you. That has to happen before anything else can happen. Moxie is, you know, this level of gumption, this level of self-belief, right? That it's not really anybody else's responsibility to have besides you, right? It's great if they do believe in you, but it's, it's up to you. So when you have that belief, that gumption drives you to do things outside your comfort zone. And particularly in sales, that's the assignment a lot of the time, right? A lot of us, you remember your very first cold call. That was not I my was sweating, zone. sweating, <laughs> pitting out. No, <laughs> really, 
can I say that on this show? Huh? You can so, say whatever so, you like, want. So there's, like there's that whole that whole aspect of it. And, and then once you find that moxie, right, and start to like believe in, yeah, I'm dope, I'm tight, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I'm the type that entertains and not observes, so to speak. That's when you find the third one. That's when you find your magic. When you put all these things together, right? I've stopped convincing myself that things have to be hard, right? I take this, this is going to be really difficult and turn it into this can be a lot of fun, right? So you just, the, the can be a lot of fun is not lying, but you're telling yourself these two things are not mutually exclusive. And then again, the moxie, I'm just going to go in there and do it. And I can give examples of what that's looked like in a, in a second here. And like I said, then, then the magic, then people, in my case, the mindset and the moxie drove me to start creating content. And the magic happened when that started attracting people, you know, not people I necessarily wanted to sell to, but, you know, more importantly, people who I wanted to link arms with in the sales community and the sales profession because y'all we've been through a lot we've been through it <laughs> we've been through a lot and you know it just didn't feel authentic to keep you know smiling and talking about subject lines when i knew we kind of all just needed a hug and some time together so anyway mindset moxie magic at a high level have been the themes that have sort of willed me through this path from sdr to, to cro First of all, I love a three-step repeatable process, so we'll have to share that with everyone. But <laughs> I think you brought up a really interesting point that like, it doesn't make sense to keep talking about subject lines at this time. The sales industry in particular is rapidly changing and cold calling and those classic outbound strategies are no longer working, right? People don't trust salespeople. We have a bad rep sometimes and no one responds. Open rates are down, close rates are down. And I know that you in particular are very interested in talking about being fundamentally human in the sales process, which I think is more critical than ever right now. And I'd love to love for you to speak to that a little bit of what you mean by that and how salespeople can incorporate that human element right now. Yeah, I mean, we can't ignore the power and the pace with which generative AI is you know, finding its its home in our profession and in our, our workflows and how we do this business. I don't believe, you know, I'm like knock on wood. <laughs> I don't believe that we're as close to the demise of the profession as people think, right? Because of those things, case in point, like if, if you've ever actually tried to use like, I don't know, like a chat GPT to like create, even to create like a LinkedIn post, the thing that it lacks is that humanity the thing that it lacks is if i'm if you were to because i've tried it right hey write a post you know take a look at this person nikki ivy right and i give it like my linkedin profile and i say check out anything you can find that she's written or that's written about her and try and understand her writing style right and then it described to me my writing style. Once I got it to understand my writing style, then I asked, right? Create a LinkedIn post, right? In the style of Nikki Ivy about X topic. And it did, but very quickly when you read it, right? It was a great, it was well-written, but when you read it, there's no me in there. And I'm not saying that, like, I think there are a lot of really good practical uses right, for this. And I think those exist in sales. I would count things like Lavender, right, as a really good example of that, right, example of AI actually being helpful without replacing salespeople. But for me, as a buyer, I feel pretty confident about my ability to tell the difference between the two. And I am totally turned off by something that feels generative. And so if we know that, A, it's all is not lost, right? Like we don't need to compete with these things. We just need to differentiate from them. And so what that does look like is just sort of taking some of the principles that we've already been practicing in sales to break through and be human and taking it a step further. So for instance, the permission-based call opener, right? What we learned over time was that saying things like, hey, you know, is this a good time or hope you're doing well or how are you at the beginning of conversations? That was being rejected by people that we were calling because it felt robotic, 
right? Nobody does want to hear you reading a script. So we came up with this, you know, hey, you know, yes, it's a cold call, but do you have such and such seconds or do you want to roll the dice? And I think those are the precursors, right, to what it looks like to really be human. But the problem is all of us have been reading that, right? All the salespeople are using those now. And while they're, so while they're effective, we're going to have to start now to think about different, even more human ways to say that. So taking this, yes, this is a cold call. Do you want to roll the dice? Calling it out even further, right? And saying, yes, this is a sales call. But if we do it right, it doesn't have to feel like one. Are you up for it? Right? So there, it's a subtle difference. We still are asking for permission and we still are doing this as a pattern interrupt, but we're doing it in a way that, so if something that was generative said that phrase, right, said it doesn't have to feel like one, chances are it would still feel like one, even if that phrase got someone into a conversation, but it's incumbent upon the us then as human beings, once we get that permission and we've sort of signaled in the least ambiguous way we possibly can that we're like real people, then it's up to us to just actually have conversations, just actually drop whatever the veneer is, right? Break the character. Which is hard. It's hard because a lot of the way we learn in sales is more rooted in science than it is in art. And what I'm talking about is art. I think sales in general is a combination of science and art. And if you lean too far one way or the other, you kind of lose that magic you were talking about earlier. Absolutely. And with obviously, you know, the old school sales folks, they, they're, they're set in their ways, as we always hear, with their openers and how they follow up and how they book meetings and whatnot. So what advice do you have for people that do want to incorporate that more human element in their outreach and really have authentic conversations versus those stiff, traditional, you know, outbound cold call conversations? I think first you have to like give yourself a break, right? I mean, it's this, it follows the same pattern, right? The same mindset, about free magic pattern, right? Like in the micro Give yourself a break and know that this is something that's going to take practice. This is something like all other things in sales, right? That we're likely to fail at more than we win at at first, at least. So it's okay. It's okay if, if you've been doing these other things and you know, all of us are, all of are sort of this forced evolution that's happening. But once you've sort of worked through that, don't be afraid to have role plays with your peers inside and outside of your organization, because that's going to be the lowest stakes way to practice. And it's absolutely necessary. You're just going to have to do it. The reason why I say don't be afraid, like I'm projecting, it's me. I <laughs> used to absolutely <laughs> dread, dread role play. Why are we doing this? This is embarrassing. Like with a leader, it was totally fine. Totally fine. Cool with a call review. But if I was sitting with my peers, right, because sales is competitive, I was like, if I do this wrong, I'll look weak, I'll look dumb. And even if everybody's super nice to me, like, I'll be like, mm, there's Nikki, she tries. So I just... there's really nothing harder than trying to role play with your your peers at your company. Oh, my God. They'll know like... if you mess up. They know what the product should look like or what you should say about every little feature. They know all of it. And then you always have that one character that just wants to like give you a much harder time than any prospect would on the cold call. And it's like, okay, fam, that's not even in our objections to practice. But anyway, <laughs> so so there's there's all of that. And I, I say, yeah. yeah, step one, the mindset shift. Step two, absolutely like develop within yourself and as much as you can among your peers, a culture of that kind of active practicing. And then of course, right, as I mentioned a moment ago, reviewing your calls. One other piece that I think, and I'm, I'm working on something that I, I hope will help salespeople with this, but I think that, you know, in this journey that I took from SDR to CRO, I had very limited experience as a buyer, right, with buyers coming from an IAC role into a direct level role, right? Meaning I didn't under get to really understand what that process was like outside of what I could like read or chat about with, you know, my leader. And then once I was on the other sort of side of the table, 
and I'm, you know, the one who's receiving the cold calls. I'm the one who's sitting through the, the demos. Well, then a lot of stuff just became very clear, very clear. Oh, I see why. Now I understand why it's not effective when I say that. Now I understand why it makes people hang up when we enter the conversation this way. Why beyond the science, right? Why just in this sort of human emotional way that empathy is now built and it's incredibly difficult to do that if your experience with buyers is always right just i'm an sdr i book meetings with them and that's what i know about my icp so anyway the, the, what i'm talking about this instructive thing that i think we're gonna have to do is you know when we listen to calls yes we're most of the time we're looking to hear what we said right we're looking we're approaching it from this very technical how can I diagnose and identify, right, where I lost the pitch, right, where I said the wrong thing? We're going to need to listen more closely to every single thing, every single data point that those buyers are giving us in those conversations as to what that persona responds to, right, in a buying process. So for me, that'll be the third one. So there's the mind shift. There is this practicing and not being afraid to role play. And then there is just digging in as much as you possibly can to what your buyer's you know, processes are, what their habits are relative to how they interact with salespeople. There's really no other way to get there. And, you know, look, I do it sequentially, right? I say mindset moxie magic. But the thing is, if what you specifically right now need to focus in on is just, hey, I want to know them better. Just start showing up at their web webinars, right? If there's a webinar for marketers and you sell to marketers, go and see what kind of questions these marketers are asking around this specific problem that is the topic of the, of the webinar. You don't even have to like talk to anybody if you don't want to, although it can be fun in the chat, right? And instructive, but like, that's what it's going to have to take. I'm, I implore us salespeople to lean into that radical humanity. Me too. I love radical humanity. And I think it goes hand in hand with social selling, which I know Ashley is really good at. Like I see Ashley all the time attending events where other salespeople that could be potential buyers are. I see her interacting on their posts and commenting back or creating content that's relevant to them. And I have no doubt that they trust you more as a buyer because you're putting your authentic self out there. Like this is a real person that understands me. And people buy from people. We hear that term all the time. And I think if you can show your humanity that you're not an AI bot, right, that's just generating what they think they want to hear, I think you're going to do so much better as a salesperson. You're going to outperform everyone else on your team who's not doing that. Yeah, Katrine, that's such a good point. I love that you draw this connection between that and social selling. It's actually part of you know, the other part of the answer, right, as to, okay, well, how does one go from SDR to CRO? It's taking a holistic view of every piece of the go-to-market function and understanding that that interconnectivity is actually like where it's at. It's not yeah. as simple as this buzzy conversation, like you got to have sales and marketing alignment. No, 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 no. You got to have go-to-market alignment. You got to be able to look at this as like, these are our revenue operations. They do not actually happen in silos. And that's why we can't perform those jobs inside. Not just because of like the company culture impact, which yes, is real, but we ignore, right, the way that all of this stuff plays out if we do it separately. So for me, for instance, right, I was on an SDR team and then had sort of outgrown that role, but there weren't any AE roles at this company. And, you know, I had the marketing team had taken notice of, of the content that I was putting out. And I was very vocal about wanting to help, right? About encouraging them. Hey, I saw that we, you know, we shared this one, whatever that new PDF download, I think it's going to go crazy in these streets, right? Like, so I was making these internal relationships with these departments that traditionally, right? We're not supposed to get along with, right? It's supposed to be like a whole choreographed knife fight, like in the Michael Jackson video, beat it, like, but you know what? <laughs> when we go against, when I want to get against that grain, right? So then I found myself on these marketing teams and it led me to these really interesting positions, right? At Sixth Sense, I was doing social, but actually also doing some kind of like recon for the BDR team, right? Meaning I'm a BDR and I've been trying to crack into this account and I'm like, 
oh, I just liked her tweet the other day. You know what I'm saying? Like, here's what she's talking about. Let's try this to get in there, right? And this is the top of funnel social marketer position that I'm coming from there, right? And it led me to this place where at the role just previous to, to where I am now, inclusive, where I was hired as a head of sales. And again, I got really interested in the value prop and how it's positioned on the website. I got really interested in, you know, what our, our walkthrough videos look like. Do we have a wow demo? Do we have these things? I'm getting excited about them. And they're like, you know what? Since you seem to be interested in all of the things that impact revenue, right? Just be the chief of it. So, so again, like it's, I'm not even, I can't make this stuff up. That's really what happened. I was just interested in all of these different functions. I learned as much as I could about not just that they're interconnected, but why they're interconnected and what other parts of the business that that touches. And then I just got excited about, well, you know, with this approach, who can I help? What impact can I make, you know, on the community of sellers, on how this job is done, on elevating the the profession? And here we are. I, I'm comfortable talking about myself, but I have to pause and say, like, I really do feel like I'm like, and then I did this and that. <laughs> I don't want I don't want it to be like that. <laughs> but that's good. As women, we need to speak up a little bit more about that because it's hard for us. I mean, I'm generalizing quite a bit here, but I think what I've seen, and I know that from my own experience, it's harder for us to say like, and I did this thing and I'm really proud of it. Whereas our counterparts that are maybe not identifying as women do not, they don't even hesitate. They're like, check out this right. dope thing I did. I'm amazing. And I think Agreed. you should own it. And during our, and be, Ashley mentioned earlier that we host a monthly yeah. meetup with Gong called the Women in Revenue Meetup. And there was one session in particular that really sticks my mind in, in regards to this conversation where mm -hmm. we're waiting for everyone to join. There's probably 15 women in there. And instead of coming up with a you know fun icebreaker of like, what's everyone doing this weekend? We're like, hey, why doesn't everyone go around and share something they accomplished this week? And it was radio silent for like a solid minute which seems like an eternity when you're on a call yeah. until finally someone's like i'll go i closed the biggest deal of my life yesterday and we're like why didn't you say that earlier like that's insane that's incredible and then finally everyone started being like oh i finally got into this account that i've been trying to go after for two years like these amazing accomplishments that these women were so scared to bring up they were so nervous to brag about themselves quote unquote and we were like we got to talk about this more. We got to lift each other up and say, hey, you crushed it. You should be proud of yourself for becoming CRO simply because you were interested in all the different revenue functions. Like, it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think like, in a practical way, what's been difficult for me when it comes to that is not knowing how, like just the words to say, how to answer yeah. or respond when someone is. There is a way to be able to take compliments and you've kind of, for me anyway, something I've had to learn. And by learn, I mean, I saw this TikTok the other day or maybe it was an Instagram reel and it was Lady Gaga and she was saying that. She was saying like, when someone gives you a compliment, it is, it, a lot of the time, it is what you just described, Katrine. It's like, mm, I did a thing. But Lady Gaga was like, hey, you know, when someone says that to you, say, you know, I worked really hard on it. It means a lot to me that you recognize that. Thank you. I worked really hard on it. And I think it came out great. Thank you. So I was like, oh, this is something that I can say beyond thank you. Right. Or beyond that's yeah. nice of you to say. Right. Because both of those kind of like, like you're saying, they reinforce this downplaying of it. So with that and then the other question that I have a hard time like specific to being like a woman in this industry someone's trying to help me like trying to mentor me or trying to sponsor me and they ask they just broadly ask like what can I what are you what can I help you with right and I'm like I know I need help but I, but I don't know what I need help with so like the feedback was for both of us right the feedback is for the person who's the mentor to ask more specific questions and for me to have like a prepared pivot not into necessarily what I'm going to, like, I'm going to tell everybody the same thing, but how do I get from, you know, I'm so glad this person is helping me. Yay, yay, yay. Oh, shoot. They asked me a question about what they can help me with. And it's so much stuff, you know? So, so it did. It's about like letting yourself 
get excited and confident about what you are working on. If what you are working on is some fabulous side hustle that's going to become a unicorn someday, sure, right? Talk about that. But a lot of the time, what you're working on could very well just be, doesn't, make, doesn't even have to have anything to do with like family. I'm, I'm working on time management. Do you know any, you know, what's worked for you? Things like that. So anyway, I digress a bit, but that's that it's been a combination of all of those things. Like you said, right. Understanding how to take yeah. compliments and then how to leverage, right. Really take and run with when someone's trying to help you. So what general advice do you have for yeah. a woman that's currently in an SDR or AE position and they want to become a manager, a director, and eventually a CRO? What can they do? Where can they start? Start your wow file today. One of the things that happens when you leave an organization as an individual seller is you don't have access to documentation of any of the things you did well. They're going to ask you for it in an interview. Although, you know what I'm saying, right? So what you should do ahead of time is decide, what do I want, right, to be known for impacting at this organization, right? Step one, do that thing. And then step two, again, like, what does that look like? So for me, as an SDR, I want to be known for, you know, dollars in the pipeline. I want to be known for you know, being a galvanizing force on a sales floor, right? How did I show up for folks? And I want to be known for being, you know, coachable, being a person who is easy to work with on a team beyond being able to motivate and inspire, right? Is there that give and take? And so if those were the goals and I knew that those are the things I want to demonstrate, now when I'm doing this work, I'm driven by something else. I don't just want to hit quota, I want to be able to say when I leave this organization, I put, I contributed a million dollars to pipeline at this last company, right? Quarter over quarter, I was, you know, consistently be counted on for this and I delivered. And then again, document those things, document any time your leader sends you a slack that's a kudos and a buyer has said something to you that was great. List the names of the companies. Doesn't have to be the individuals companies who you've closed deals with. The file doesn't have to be like a hard copy paper file, of course, but store these things someplace. And when you do that, the position you're in at that point, when you go to talk about a promotion, is, it is not conjecture. It is not just my opinion that I should be promoted. And I don't want you to do it just because you like me, right? I want you to take a look at this, right? I see you because this tale is old as time. I've been an SDR for like two years, say, at this organization, and then I see like they have a job ad for an AE role, and I'm like, but why are y'all hiring externally for this AE role, and I know I can do it. So you're challenging those folks. You all are looking far and wide and spending money trying to find someone to fill this role, right? Here, gaze upon my accomplishments in this wild file. Here's what I've been giving you consistently, right, in the pipeline. Here is what people who are working with me are saying. And when I look at this job description that you put out for this AE, right? I'm seeing this alignment. Are you seeing that alignment? And if you are, what do you think about it? You know, there's that moxie. But you know what I'm saying, right? Like it really is going to have to be yeah. this responsibility for you to do those things. I do this now still. A lot of the time it's it's shifted for me from being simply, you know, documenting metrics and things like that as far as why I hold on to those things and I do I hold on to you know interviews like this right if I'm having a particularly down day I'm not feeling confident I'm not feeling moxie and my mindset is taking a beating I go back and I listen to these conversations I do go back and revisit things that you know customers leaders teammates have said to me that make me feel good about myself and I remember that I'm that person still, right? So again, start with the wow file. If you really are trying to make progress, be as detailed as you can, right? Draw as many parallels between the next role that you want and what you're doing now so that, you know, they're going to really have to like give you reasons, right? When they, if they tell you no, because you've got an airtight case for yourself. 
Here's a little bit of a a loaded question for you Mm -hmm. to follow up from that. What if you have all of the proof? You have the numbers, the stats, the statistics, the experience, and you still don't get it to someone who, let's say, is not a woman in revenue or sales, and it goes to someone else. Are they doing that? Oh, I don't know. (laughs) It's a time as old as tale, apparently. (laughs) Do you have any advice for women that are experiencing that where they feel like they're like beating their head against the wall? Like, what more can I do to prove that I am I'm the perfect fit for this role? Yeah, I mean, there's a part of that answer that is unfortunate, but that the numbers bear out, right? The numbers bear out that, you know, women are opting for entrepreneurial endeavors because that is the wall that they hit. And the the reason why that wall stands is because it is incredibly difficult to prove that it's happened to you. So when it does, and you're sure that it has, that person or that party that's, that is doing this to you, like it's a whole thing, a whole process to hold them accountable for that. Right like a whole like investigation type piece and respectfully it can be exhausting for some people. Right. So if you don't feel like you can take that kind of recourse, right. Which you are totally justified and and do. And I would, if I were able, but if you don't feel like you could take that recourse, because maybe again, you don't have proof or you don't have the resources. Like my girl, Gabrielle Blackwell said, you got to vote with your feet because, and do not be afraid to tell that story. You can tell that story without dragging that, particular organization but tell that story right like and it will be really obvious that the recruiter that you go to work with right which is what I would do in that case I would go find an executive recruiter or a recruiter that fills the kinds of roles that I want I would show them this wow file and I would say yeah I know they passed their loss and that person is going to be really excited about helping you find a place that will respect you and believe in you enough to go outside of the status quo, right? If I could guess, if I could suppose at the sort of foundation on which these types of things happen, right? People being passed over in ways that look very much like it has to do with their status as a member of a protected group, right? Women, LGBTQIA, Black, whatever it is, right? So like if I, the reason why that happens especially in a down economy, I think, is because folks are trying to mitigate risk. And in a way that they are often not conscious of, hiring a person who is different from the types of people that have made you successful so far feels like a risk. Now, what we know is all of the data says that it's in fact not, right? In fact, you stand to gain a lot more. But again, we're talking about a, an unconscious emotional reaction to the very idea of it. That is one that when I can, when I am in a position of influence, I challenge it head on. Because I've been asked. I get asked more than I care to really get into, right? Or more than I wish was true. I have been asked the question, hey, you know, I'll say something like, oh, there need to be more women. Right. I took a look. Looks like there's not a lot of women on your team. Right. And then you get, mm, we just want to hire the best people for the job. Right. Okay. But that's what I said. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, what? Think about that. Think about the psychology of that. Right. I've asked you why you didn't hire women. And your answer is because I wanted the best. That's what you said. You see what I'm saying? Built into that is you believe there is a greater risk that a woman will not be the best then there is risk involved in the people like you've been hiring. That's the problem. But the way I challenge, I just ask them, when is the last time you asked, right? Do you want me to talk about the ROI of hiring a diverse group? When was the last time you asked for the ROI of hiring the archetype that's overrepresented there at your organization? I don't ask it this aggressively because of what I really want, I feel this aggressively, but I don't, what I really am trying to do, right, is invite people, encourage them to think. Because again, like I'm willing to grant that these are unconscious things that people are just doing, 
not knowing that they're doing them. Like personally, I know these folks, if they thought about it that way, it wouldn't even be take them long to be like, oh, okay, yeah, I am. I am treating this like it's more more risky. Not that there's not going to be ones that, you know, don't ever get it. But, you know, what's for them is for them. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's true. And what's, and what's for you is for you. Yeah. So, that's, so that's what it is, right? When you see it, if it's happening to you and outside of taking, you know, any kind of like legal or, or official recourse, get out of there. You've got your wow file. You've got, now have a plan to get out of there because I'm, I've been in a position, I'm a mother of four, right? Get out of there is all, not always that simple. But, you know, make yourself a plan to be able to get out and land on your feet and leverage people in your network, specifically folks that fill the kinds of roles that you want and, you know, be candid with them about what's happening to you and share with them why it is this other organization's loss. That's very Yay. helpful. <laughs> I aim Just to full be helpful. wisdom, full of wisdom, Nikki. <laughs> I love it. So much wisdom <laughs> and so much truth. Should yeah. we do our rapid fire now? We want so to make sure we're aware we'll of time. So we typically will wrap up the episode by shooting off rapid fire. Would you rather revenue edition questions? You don't have to think about them. You can just respond. If you would like to explain your answer, you're more than welcome to. But it's just a fun way of, of getting to know you a little bit better. Okay, um, I'm just going to have to answer them because if y'all see this, if I get to talking and explaining, we'll only get through one. So, <laughs> Nikki. Would you rather close a ton of really small deals or one really large deal? Send the small deals. Would you rather build a full-blown outbound strategy or a full-blown inbound strategy? And you outbound. can't touch the other. Love outbound. It. Would you rather spend a full day of cold calling or a full day of doing data entry? Oh, cold calling. Would you rather sell a product that nice. you are super passionate about, but it's not built well, or would you rather sell a product that doesn't interest you, but it's built really well? Oof. I have been in both situations. Oh, hold on. One more time. Give me the options. One more time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> would you rather sell a product that you're really passionate about, but it's not built well? Or would you rather sell a product that doesn't interest you, but it's made very well? I think it'd have to be the not built well one. And I know, I know, I know. Right. I agree. Uh, I agree. But- Ooh, How okay, do you sell if, if, something you're not passionate about, you know? That's the part. And if I'm supposed to be human, I need to be able to empathize with the people exactly. that I that I work, you know, that I sell to specifically with their problems. And if I don't know or particularly care about their problems, I'm going to not be as successful. You're not invested. Exactly. We can always fix the what's broken with the product, right? Yeah. We'll just hound that engineering team, right? Hire Come some on, good guys. developers. No. <laughs> it's on the roadmap. No. <laughs> In a year, I swear. No. <laughs> All right. Final would you rather question. Would you rather have to give a pep talk to your team only using Peppa Pig quotes? Or would you rather have to run a lap outside every time a deal on your team falls through? Yeah, we're going to go with Peppa Pig. You're a mom of four. I was expecting that answer. Yeah, like... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there's that. There is the mama four aspect of it. You got to respect Peppa Pig. But also, like, I was born in 1981. I'm at the point in my life where I get winded, okay? All right? So so she's not running laps. We're not doing that. You got to work on that British accent then <laughs> for next time. <laughs> well, Nikki, thank oh, you man. so much for joining us today. You are seriously such a source of information and wisdom and advice. I know everyone that's listening today is really going to appreciate your thoughts and all your tips on having mindset, moxie, and magic and how they too can progress in their careers. And we really appreciate you being here. Yeah, this was so fun. You two are delightful Thanks, and I'm, I'm excited to watch the progression and success of what you all are doing with this show. It's great. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Ashley and Katrina's Infinite Revenue Playlist. This show is powered by Comsor, the go-to-network company. Comsor is the complete suite of tools for teams looking to grow, activate, and engage their networks. If you enjoyed the learnings and banter in this episode, there's more where this came from. Follow Ashley and Katrina's Infinite Revenue Playlist wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. See you next time.